Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be focusing on those words from Matthew 26, Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here. We, we come with all of our questions, with all of our doubts, and we, we ask you, Lord God, do you still want us to pray even when sometimes our prayers seem useless, even when you don't seem to answer our prayers, the ones that we think you should have answered? Lord God, I pray that you would overcome our doubts and our fears through your word. I pray that I, your servant, wouldn't get in the way of your word. We want to hear from you, Lord Jesus. Speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. We started this sermon series at the beginning of, of this month. We wanted to kick off uh, a whole new ser- series as people are getting back in the routine of, of church and school and life. And, and I've been thinking about this all summer, about what, does, what do we need as a congregation? And I kept kind of coming back to this idea of prayer. Because I don't think prayer is one of our strengths, and we've talked about this before. I think one of our strengths is we love preaching, we love uh, training our leaders, uh, we love coming to worship. We, we think about those things as absolute priorities as Christians and especially as Lutherans, but I don't know if we're known for praying. A lot of times we just have religious leaders do the praying or, or maybe we'll just say the rote prayers which are fine, which are good, the come Lord Jesuses and the now I lay me's. But as far as having a, an intimate relationship, a personal relationship with God and, and having that kind of deeper relationship, that takes communication. And I thought, this is what we need to work on. That's what I need to work on in my life. And so I wanted to answer maybe some of the things that have kept you from praying and kept me from praying. And so the first week we talked about why pray. Does God really want us to pray? We know he wants us to hear God's word. We know he wants us to read devotions. We know he wants us to give generously. We know he wants us to to train leaders. We know all of that. But does he actually want to hear from us? Does he want us to talk to him? And and we looked at that and, and Jesus says, pray and never give up. I want every one of you to pray all the time. Talk to me. And we thought, well, how do you pray? We talked about the next week. Maybe you've never seen anyone model prayer. You didn't have a father or a mother who ever spontaneously prayed in front of you. And so you maybe didn't have the language to pray. And so maybe you've never prayed out loud with your spouse, never grabbed her hand or grabbed his hand and said a prayer out loud. Maybe you've never prayed with a neighbor, a friend, you know, over coffee and they're going through a tragedy and you, you speak words out loud. So how do you even do that? So we talked about taking the Lord's Prayer as maybe not just a a rote prayer we'd say, but as an outline. Not that you have to pray through the Lord's Prayer as an outline every time, but maybe grab a petition. Grab one of those phrases, Lord, let your will be done in this tragedy. Lord, give us today our daily bread. We, We need a job. Whatever that is, getting the language of prayer. How do you pray? And then last week we talked about something that's probably even more difficult. Does prayer change anything? Because we won't do something if, unless we see a purpose behind it, unless we see it's going to make a difference. And so we talked about prayer. It does change things. We looked at Moses and how Moses actually changed the situation. God relented and didn't bring the destruction on Israel that he had planned. But out of all those things that we've talked about, I don't know about you, but what we're going to talk about today is probably one of the greatest challenges to our prayer life. Answering this question. What about unanswered prayers? You hear me talk about protecting children quite a bit. It's kind of a, a, it's become kind of a passion of mine and and I'm on a, I'm on a committee for our church body. I'm the chairman of a website called Freedom for the Captives where we try to equip leaders and uh, to protect children and also support survivors of child abuse. And one of the things that makes me so passionate about this whole idea of protecting people, is I've had way too many people come into my office and tell me, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I still was abused. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I was still a victim of violence. And then I, not just the ones that I've had contact with, but all the stories I've read, and it drives me to want to help and to serve. And I, and I have to be honest, that is probably one of the most difficult questions I've ever gotten. And, and you've been there. Maybe you've been that, that child who's, who's been in that violent situation. Or maybe 
uh, you, you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you said, you know, God wants life. He, he wants us to, to have, have children and have life and, and you lost that baby even after all you prayed. Or, or you, you know, God wants you to provide for your family and so you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you still didn't get that job. Or, or God wants you to, to have a healthy relationship or marriage and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and that relationship or friendship or marriage still ended. And the logic goes, and this is where my brain goes, I don't know about you, but I think if God didn't answer that no-brainer right here, that, that softball of a prayer that, that I think this is, an, a, this is the one he should have answered, if he didn't answer that, that easy prayer or that, that no-brainer prayer, that obvious prayer, why pray for other things? Why pray for for what's coming in the future if he didn't seem to answer what happened in the past. And, and I'll about you, but that's kept me from praying. So let's answer that question. Let's, let's see what we can do to face that head on and see if this is what really should keep us from praying. And to do that, we want to go to one of the most raw scenes in all of the Bible. God in the flesh calling out for a change, calling out to his Father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night before Jesus would be crucified and it says that Jesus took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's Peter, James, and John. These were the three fishermen. And he took, he really poured his life into these three men. He, he didn't bring all 12 disciples with him everywhere, but he always brought at least these three in very important times. These seemed to be a little bit more close to him. He took them with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled and then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Think about that. Just the thought of what would happen to him within 12 hours or less. The thought of being beaten and abused and stripped naked and, and, and whipped and hung on a cross, but then the worst of all, that all of God's righteous anger that was supposed to be poured out on the world was going to be poured out on Jesus. The very thought of having to experience that almost killed him. And so what did he do? Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. I think that's pretty remarkable that Jesus went to his heavenly father in prayer, falling with his face to the ground. When he knew that nothing was necessarily going to be changed, he was still going to go to the cross. So if you're wondering, why pray if it seems inevitable? Here's a simple answer, because Jesus did. (laughs) Why pray if it doesn't seem like anything's going to change? Because Jesus did. And we want to get into the content of that prayer. But first, I don't know about you, but as a kid, this word always kind of tripped me up when I heard this, the cup. What do you mean, Jesus, by taking a cup from him? Why didn't he say, take this suffering from me? Why, why not say, take this dying on the cross from me? Why did he say, may this cup be taken from me? Well, when you read the Bible, you, you might find this phrase coming up over and over again throughout the Bible of a cup. Psalm 23, my cup, the old King James Version, my cup runneth over. I was just reading actually yesterday morning my daily Bible reading on Isaiah 50 where he says, I gave you a cup of suffering that you had to drink down to the very dregs and it was a cup um, that made you stagger. And so you see this picture over and over again in the Bible. The idea of a cup in the Bible in that culture was This is the hand that you were dealt. It's not a fatalistic view of your life, but it's just there are some things that that happen to you. Uh, You can't choose where you're born. You can't choose the family you're born into. You can't choose some of the things that, that are restrictions on your life, some of your genetics, some of the things that have happened to you. You can make lots and lots of choices in your life, but there are some things that are just your cup, your calling, the things that have happened to you, and, and today, again, we would say something like, you got to play with the card you're dealt, right? You got to play with the card you're dealt. Again, not a fatalistic view, but that's the cup. The cup is your life. The cup is, the, is what, what, what's been handed to you. And what's remarkable here is Jesus says, my father 
if it is possible, take this cup from me. May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What does that tell you? That although Jesus knew it was probably inevitable, there was no way out, he still prayed this prayer. And, and so think about that. When you have a loved one who's in stage 4 cancer, you can still pray that prayer. Uh, when, you have, when, when you're about to sign the papers for the divorce, you can still pray the prayer, may this stop. You can still make those, those prayers. You can still make big prayers even though it seems inevitable. Don't let the impossibility of the answer keep you from praying because it didn't keep Jesus from praying. He still prayed, if it is possible, stop it. Stop this from happening. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. This is kind of interesting here, Peter. It was only, I don't know, maybe an hour before this or a couple hours before this where Peter was saying, I'm ready to die for you. I'm ready to, to do anything for you. And he says, couldn't you men, oh yeah, especially you, Peter, couldn't you just keep watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think this really clearly explains the human nature. We want to pray, right? We want to pray, but, but you, hasn't this happened to you? You sit down to pray, and you weren't distracted by anything five minutes ago, but you start to pray, and you're distracted by all the different things that is going on. Not just that, but you have all the doubts that flood into your mind. Why pray? He didn't answer that prayer before, and so you have all these doubts that flood your mind. Our spirit is willing, but our sinful flesh is weak. That's why we need Jesus, our substitute. Our flesh is so weak, we give up. We wonder if he answers, wonder if God cares. We give up. Jesus went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Do you notice? He changed the prayer. The first time he said, if it is possible, is, is there a way out? If there is a way out, may this cup be taken from me. But now he's saying, if it's not possible, if this is the lot that I have, if this is my calling, if this is what you're calling me to, may your will be done. He, he's accepting it. He's accepting this is what's happened. This is what you're calling me to do. But notice what he also, how he ends this prayer just like he did the first time. May your will be done. There's hope there. See, he trusts his heavenly Father. He has hope that even in the worst circumstances, the worst tragedy, God is able to turn it and use it for the greatest good. And that's what we read in the, in the book of Hebrews, that God used the worst thing possible to, turn the, to make the greatest good. And that's what kept Jesus going. Because in Hebrews it says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and rose and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. May your will be done. See, there's hope every time you pray. Every time. I've heard, as we've been discussing prayer over this month in small groups and in Bible study and here, I've heard some of you reference that idea that when you pray, God will answer yes, no, or maybe later. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before. Yes, no, or, okay, so you've heard that, right? Yes, no, or maybe later. I had a professor who made it even shorter. He said, when you pray, God will answer either yes, or I'll give you something better. Yes, or I'll give you something better. And that's an act of trust, that God would give us something better. And he did in this case, didn't he? He, he, he said, I'll give you something better than just taking this cup from you. I will turn this suffering into the salvation of the world. That now heaven will be filled with God's people because you've went through this suffering. Because So your will be done is an act of faith. All right, whatever you allow God, whatever you let pass through your hands, it's going to be turned out for my ultimate good. And it was. Again, you think about the cup that Jesus drank from the cup of suffering so that today you get to drink from the cup of blessing. 
Jesus drank from the cup of God's wrath so that today when you come to this table, you receive Jesus' body and blood, this new covenant meal where he says, I love you, I forgive you, and ultimately whatever kind of pain and suffering you endure here is the closest to hell that you'll ever be. Ultimately, eternally, you will drink at the wedding table of the Lamb, the eternity of being in my presence in the new heaven and new earth with a new body. And someday you'll get that, that he said, I'll give you something better. I'm going to give you something better. I, I, I not necessarily want this to happen. It's not necessarily part of what, what pleases me that you're suffering, but I will give you something better. So let's, let's recap. Let's think about this. What about unanswered prayers? What do we learn from this very short prayer, this very short section in Matthew 26? Number one, you can pray for a way out. Don't stop praying for a way out. You, you meet a, a, a wall and it looks inevitable. It's okay to pray, God, save this child. God, help this situation. God, turn this around. Save my loved one. Do something big. Do a miracle. It's okay to pray those big prayers even though they don't seem, it, it seems to be inevitable. Jesus did. He prayed a huge prayer. God, may this cup pass from me. And then if, if God says, I'll give you, or uh, says no, understand he's saying, I'm going to give you something better. Trust in something better. Trust that he's going to use this for your eternal good. And then finally, in the middle of all that messiness, where you don't realize, how could this be any better? How could this be good? Receive the cup of blessing. Continue to receive the cup of God's love and of forgiveness and acceptance in the Lord's Supper. When you read God's word, continue to receive and accept that cup of blessing because he received the cup of suffering. And that will give you peace in the middle of all this uncertainty. But still the question is, but why pray? What, what is it going to do? If God's going to say no anyways, why still pray? Well, this came up in our Bible study last week after worship and this is a great conversation in Bible study. And somebody said, well, sometimes when we pray, God doesn't change the circumstance. He changes us. Do you remember how Jesus entered into the Garden of Gethsemane? He said he was overwhelmed to the point of death. Now look at him. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. As he prayed, as he trusted in his heavenly Father, Jesus was strengthened. In fact, in the book of Luke, we hear that God sent an angel to encourage him and strengthen him. And now he leaves and he says, rise, let us go. I can face my life. I can face my cup. I can face my lot. I can face my calling because I know it's the Lord's will and I know he's going to be with me and I know he's going to use this for the ultimate good of saving the world. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. That's what happens when we pray. Sometimes our situations don't change, but we change. And we receive more strength. And we become a new person. So here's a takeaway. Here's, again, I don't think I'm going to be able to erase all of your doubts in one sermon and, 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 and change everything that's happened in your past. But here's what, I, here's what I hope. I hope you can keep praying even when God seems to be the enemy. Starting today, starting today, right now, that you start praying. Maybe you stop praying for a couple months, maybe for a couple years, maybe for a couple decades. You come to church and you listen to the word, but you think prayer is a waste of time. Today, I, I encourage you to take that step of faith and start praying, even if you think God seems to be your enemy, because he's not. He's not. He hears every single one of your prayers, every single one of them. We started this saying that we're going to talk about prayer is, is God really listening? Is anyone really listening? He absolutely is. And you can start taking that step 
of grabbing the hand of your coworker and praying with him or her and grabbing the hand of your spouse and praying out loud and start doing some of the scary stuff of praying out loud together and praying out loud by yourself and talking to God and don't let anything get in your way. Not the times in your past where it seems to be unanswered prayers. Not maybe you're, you feel like you're fumbling through language. Not your doubts of anything's going to change. Never, never, never give up. That's what Jesus told you. Pray. Pray and never, ever, ever give up. Amen. Please stand.